for coming out tonight, guys. Uh, my name is Dave Moskowitz, and I'm the creative director for Mount Caribou Initiative. What does land here mean? <laughs> um, and uh, I um, have just a couple slides to put up uh, to um, kind of tag on the end of, of uh, uh, what we just heard, and, uh, and then I'm going to bring up the rest of the uh, crew from the Mountain Caribou Initiative and a couple of other guests to uh, answer some questions that you might have and just have a bit of a conversation about this subject. So I won't repeat all the other thank yous and everything that have been said in the past, but it's, a, it's a great to have everybody here. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about action steps. And uh, if we can get the slides up for the action steps. If, um, if you saw it at the end, we said if you, you know, if you, the things I'm going to talk about, you can find out more information on our website, caribourainforest.org or laststandfilm.org. They will go to the same web, web page. And there's an action page there as well. And one of the things that was mentioned was that uh, our goals in this, uh, great, um, our goals in uh, doing this project was uh, not just to do a nature documentary and tell an interesting story about an interesting creature, though that's what it is, but. Uh, um, but it's to help inspire people to have conversations, hard conversations in their communities, and, uh, and then also uh, to take some action, to make some change, and to, um, uh, to move uh, conservation, environmental, and social justice forward in this region of the world, which is really globally unique uh, ecosystem. So uh, we have uh, four different categories of places where you could take action. So if you could hit the next slide, uh, the first one is... Uh, um, climate change, and this is something that it's easy for you to do from wherever you live in the world to help not just where you live, but the Inland Tepper Rainforest. And uh, so you can find a link to 350.org, which uh, is one one organization that's working uh, in a way that we felt like was really in solidarity, um, not just on climate change issues, but social and environmental justice issues, which is an important part of what's going on in the Inland Rainforest. Uh, so climate change is a very important thing that's affecting that ecosystem as everywhere else in the world. And then also, obviously, more directly into the point, uh, if we get the next slide. <clears throat> uh, is uh, protecting the inland rainforest. And actually, uh, we have a link on our website uh, to write a letter uh, to uh, the powers that be here in British Columbia, uh, hosted by the uh, Ancient Forest Alliance. And uh, Ken, one of the, I think the executive director will actually be up to talk uh, tonight. Uh, as well about that, so you can take some action there, and there's lots of potential opportunities at this moment in time in British Columbia about that as well, so we'll talk about that. And then the next slide uh, is um, mountain caribou conservation as well, and again, we're at a uh, moment in time where there could be some potential for some positive uh, movement here, uh, and um, actually WildSite, one of our partners, just put up an action uh, alert on their webpage, so you can go right there and submit a uh, letter directly to the provincial government as well uh, as they sort out what's next for them in relationship to some federal actions that might be happening. And so there's there. And then uh, finally um, is uh, um, just uh, the opportunity for us to be in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of, of this land and support their work to um, care for these resources that are integral uh, to their, their very culture and their, their way of life. And so. Uh, there's again many ways to do that. This is we have a link to just one uh, that can do that as well, and there'll be more coming on our website about that particular topic. And finally, with a lot, uh, one more slide. Um, if you want to support our work, uh, we greatly appreciate that. If you know an organization, a community that might want to host a screening, we'd love to hear about that. Help setting that up, and you can make tax deduct deductible donations to us and help amplify the work we're doing here. Uh, we haven't taken a, a dime in payment thus far. Uh, for all the work we've done here. Uh, we've turned it all back around to field work, uh, but um, to keep this going uh, and to uh, have the opportunity to bring this story into communities inside and out of Mountain Caribou country, we need uh, your help, which is a big part of what tonight is, is a fundraiser. So buy some more raffle tickets and actually, I believe we'll uh, sell you raffle tickets right now if you'd like. Uh, we'll have some folks come around and if you want to buy a few more raffle tickets, uh, we'd happily accept that. But anything, uh, you can do to support that as well. Greatly appreciate it. And you get the last slide. Um, so uh, with that being said, uh, I'd like to just bring up the rest of the Mountain uh, Caribou uh, Initiative team. Uh, Marcus Rainerson, 
Colin Erisman, Kim Shelton just ran out the door, but I'm sure she'll be back. And then I'd also like to bring back up Mark Worthing from Sierra Club BC, and then Ken Wu, the uh, director from Ancient Forest Alliance. Come on up. Have a seat. If you see somebody cycling up and down the aisles with raffle tickets, feel free to buy some more tickets, and then uh, we'll give you a chance to throw those in there at the end before we do the auction, or do the uh, giveaway. Um, and um, uh, I want to give a chance, uh, before we take questions from you, I just give a chance for uh, uh, everybody that's up here to uh, say a few words, um, and uh, including Kim when she gets up here. Uh, and I thought we could just start uh, by just going down. And uh, one of the questions that's come up a lot in the past that I thought would just be a great place to start off a conversation is, is around the human element of, uh, of this story. And uh, there's been a lot of, we've gotten a lot of questions about um, our personal experience in doing field work in this really unique uh, part of the world and then grappling with the really challenging issues um, that we have and the you know the things that are going on out there and then the real wide variety of, of humans that uh, live work and play in these landscapes and so um, I just thought maybe a good place to start would be for uh, folks we can just go through introduce ourselves and then you just have something that you want to share on kind of like a the human experience in the inland temperate rainforest and mountain caribou whether it's your own personal experience with that or your your work experience or you know an anecdote from somebody else that you want to share Maybe you could just introduce yourself again and then just share your story and then we'll take some questions from the crowd. Um, I'm Marcus Rennerson and uh, feeling really grateful for Bailey uh, moving around selling raffle tickets right now. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, but uh, also, uh, so I'm, I'm from Duval, Washington. I work for an organization called the Wilderness Awareness School, uh, which is helping put on this event and numerous people here are associated with and, uh, and uh, it's an organization dedicated to not uh, helping people just have a meaningful and uh, authentic relationship with the natural world and not just understanding it intellectually but like being intimate with it and uh, and that just ties in to I think that's such an important piece of this story and it has been for me is really becoming intimate and close to these wild spaces and I and feels like that's a that's just such an important part of us as a species as, as these human animals as the species of ape running around on the planet to, to to not just have this intellectual capacity of understanding but to just really be connected beautifully to the world which sustains us and um, and that's been a really important aspect of this project for me and finding ways that we can uh, to get more people out there and get more people really loving um, these wild spaces um, and being loved by them and loving them back and so that we can be moved into action. So that's been, that's been amongst many things, a, a real important piece for me. And, um, and as well as the people connection on numerous levels. And I just specifically want to mention and acknowledge the, uh, like the, these First Nations acknowledgements that we've been, that, that's been very important, but the four that were that helped us with this work here and connecting with them as people the the West Moberly and the Soto First Nations and the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho and the uh, and the Sinaix Nation for helping us with this project amongst many others as well um, those four represented here so just wanted to speak those names. Yeah, I'm Colin Ayersman. I uh, help direct and write the film. Uh, a, a big takeaway for me is. Um, thinking about kind of humans' fundamental relationship with nature. And I think it's really, really easy to feel hopeless in this uh, time and place. The problems are so big, as you see in this film, and so complex, it's easy to feel like there's not really a solution. These things are too big to really grapple with. Um, I showed this film to one of my really close friends, and the first thing he said after is, oh, humans are assholes. And I was like, oh, man, I, we kinda, I kind of swung and missed with this. I don't really want that to be what people are left with after watching this film. And um, I think it's one of the things that continues to damage our human relationship with nature is this belief that humans are incompatible with nature. And that is a story we've created and it's a new story. And I think there is some accuracy to it in today in our culture that our culture is incompatible 
our, our white settler culture is really struggling to be compatible with nature, but that is not a, a universal, and we can look back and find um, ways to move forward. So I think it's important to find those hopeful narratives to help us move forward. I'm Kim. Um, I am the narrator of this film, <laughs> and yeah, um, I also uh, met these three through Wilderness Awareness School. Uh, I work there, spending most of my time with kids, connecting kids to nature so that they feel comfortable in the outdoors and have a reason to want to protect it. And um, the one of my major reasons for being involved in this project and kind of what I jumped on immediately after Dave asked me to join was um, asking the question like, you know, how do we, as um, people who are dealing with this, like, problem of, you know, realizing that we're not exactly doing good things for the environment, and there's a lot of destruction that's happening, um, but, like, how do we um, move forward in a good way, and realizing that part of the way we do that is getting our hearts involved and creating that connection to land and place and um, I wanted to learn from the people who have lived with these caribou for thousands and thousands of years so the first nations and the tribes that um, are in caribou country and immediately jumped on like we need to meet with these people and talk with them and figure out how they're relating to the land because maybe we can learn something. Hi, I'm uh, Ken with the Ancient Forest Alliance, and um, it was actually through the Inland Rainforest where my passion for Ancient Forest began. Uh, at the time, I had actually been living in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, um, and I loved the prairie ecosystems. It was Aspen Parkland ecosystems, and the way you hug a tree in Saskatchewan there is with your right hand. <laughs> uh, but then uh, we went to, uh, through Alberta and into British Columbia, and it was actually in Mount Revelstoke National Park when I was 10 years old, where probably a lot of you have been there. Right along the Trans-Canada Highway is the Giant Cedars Trail. Um, you know, there's like a, one of the most accessible ancient forest uh, groves there, and that blew me away. To see that first stand of ancient forest um, was, was unbelievable. Okay, so you, you liked some of that, or you filmed some of it. Nice. Um, so that, that and, and the you know, importance of, of these thousand-year-old stands is that you know the problem with uh, the human relationship with the environment, or at least um, you know industrial civilization, is the lack of humility and the concept of ecosystems. People are totally divorced from ecosystems. There's no humility, uh, and these uh, just like sort of a cathedral, uh, the grandness of it, um, you know, is is there designed to make you understand the, that God and the universe is so much bigger than you. Ancient forests with these incredible cathedral-like uh, trees, thousand years old. Uh, more than any other ecosystem helped to convey or imbue that sense of humility for the bigger natural world. Um, so it's, it's something that has been a passion of mine and um, over time I've also learned to talk with and deal with and try to listen to and understand uh, diverse people. First and foremost, First Nations, um, the, the most important, um, not even, a, they're not a stakeholder, it's a level of government, nations that uh, help to determine the outcome um, for these, these landscapes. But also, um, you know, I, I believe that we need to work with uh, businesses, unions, forestry workers, chambers of commerce, um, recreation groups, faith groups, diverse, uh, you know, linguistic and cultural groups to get the science-based legislation to save ancient forests. But one particular group that I think is incredibly dedicated are the filmmakers. What's happened is over the last, uh, as we've gotten more and more news coverage on these ancient um, forest uh, ecosystems, um, we've had a whole lot of filmmakers come forward to make films about the coastal landscapes here. Um, and uh, this group here are the first ones I've seen to make, a, uh, make one um, uh, on uh, the inland temperate rainforest uh, recently, and I've been uh, highly impressed at the level of dedication. Um, this is not done to become rich, <laughs> as you know, this is basically done out of passion. So hats off to you, it's, it's a great film, it's, a, so it's like the only hipster style ancient forest film I've seen. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's catchy and I think, you know, second only to being in the ancient forest, films are way more effective than our 
uh, slideshows and my emails, even though I think I write good emails, but the films are, are more, way more effective, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. <laughs> uh, it's all personal. Yeah, everything about this kind of work is is personal. <clears throat> I'm I'm kind of of the opinion that we need to crank the volume on all of the of everything that we do about this this sort of issue, um, especially in terms of how our intellectual uh, engagement, our rational engagement with the issues and our emotional engagement with the issues are, you know, uh, we need to turn up the volume of, of what it is in, to, to, to actually love a landscape, what it is to actually love a species or, um, or a river. Um, and I think we need to turn up the volume on, on, on the other emotions too, you know, I'm pissed. I'm, I'm fucking pissed off. How many, how many caribou left in, in continental U.S.? Ten. 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 That's wild. And put that in an evolutionary, you know, time frame. This is this is the end. It's not the it's not the eleventh hour. It's the last couple seconds on the twelfth hour. Like it really is. Um, and it's unfortunate that we're the ones that sit and have to bear witness to that. But that that's what's up. Um, so in many ways, the personal aspects in in my life um, are about kind of facing the the banality of the evilness in in the systems of of wildlife management or, or non people management. Uh, as you put it, um, and I think it's important to name the enemy sometimes, like, and also acknowledge that the enemy is, of course, human, and and naturally needs to be treated with respect and and, in, and that level of engagement. When we turn the volume up on the on the love and on the hate and on like the really visceral response that we should be having to these kind of things, um, we need to name it. You know, and I'll name it right now. Canfor is logging old growth forests in Simcoe Territory, North Sequatmec Territory, near Clearwater, BC, Canfor. This is, this is a company that operates all over BC. I got friends that work for Canfor, you know? And I'm on the phone with them, being like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you can't actually stand by and, and watch this kind of thing happen. Um, I know there's this reason and that reason, but like someone's name, there's a registered practicing forester out there who's a professional forester, they, he or she went through all their schooling and they signed the documents, they signed their career and their livelihood and the way we do professional reliance and management of forests in this province, they signed their name to that, their career to that. That's a little shitty piece of paper that some regional district operator signed off and rubber stamped and boom and then Canfor rolls in with their road building permits that they've applied for six months before and boom they get rubber stamped and then somebody's name is on that. You know, these people have families, they're, they're real people, and they're not evil, obviously, but we know who they are, right? They are, they're us, like they are in our community. There's 163 wolves that got shot in 2016 in the name of caribou conservation. In the Peace, Monashi, and the Selkirks, someone pulled the trigger on those wolves, right? Uh, so it's very emotional, it's very real. Um, and I'm kind of, I don't know, I just, I, like, I, I, I want to take it all raw. I want to take the really compassionate stuff, the super uncomfortable work about uh, understanding what white privilege and, and white supremacy means in resource extraction, something that I am actively engaged in as a white male. Uh, you know, I, I, I benefit from, from those privileges. That's really uncomfortable to talk about uh, and to think about in my life. Um, but I kind of want it. Like I think we need to go there with all of this, and we need to go there with our friends that work in industry and union workers and stuff. So I don't know. I think it's all super personal, um, and I think it's important to sit with a really uncomfortable conversation. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I'd love to take. Okay. Uh, I'd love to take some questions uh, from the crowd. If there's any to kind of just move things forward. Yeah, sir. Because they want to cut back on the import of softwood lumber. 
So why don't they start by isolating areas like this and putting a freeze on any more logging in it until this crisis out? Uh, so the question there is why not freeze logging in this particular area until the crisis has passed? And then did everyone hear the, did anyone miss the summary? Okay, well, got that. Taking advantage of the current political moment. Great, yeah. And do you want to speak to that? Yeah, we've been highly focused on that in the last little while. It's pretty amazing. When you think about where politics have gone uh, in North America, especially with this uh, giant orange-faced populist, bad hair, uh, right-wing regime in the U.S., um, and all of a sudden, there's this enclave of a green social democrat governing alliance in British Columbia. That's totally unheard of in the North American context. It's happened in the European Union, it's happened in Australia, some in Tasmania, in uh, New Zealand, and um, it has produced the greatest strides forward on uh, sustainability and environmental policies. So there's a great opportunity here. The Green Party's stance is to end old growth logging and the NDP depend on the Greens to prop them up. The, N uh, the NDP themselves, I figured there's about a third of the party that's fairly um, uh, uh, aligned with these goals. However, we have our work cut out for us because they are also highly funded by the largest old growth logging union, the steelworkers, who made it crystal clear that they want to see old growth logging and raw log exports continue. So it's never easy, but the reason why I think the environmental movement has got to move outside of the environmentalist echo chamber, it's, it's because it's environmentalists organizing environmentalists and hipsters organizing hipsters, and it's just been going like this forever, and it's that same 15% of strident people. Um, the way we'll change the outcome is to diversify into uh, people who have different motivations. So that's why with the BC Liberals, we started working with the Chambers of Commerce who wanted the tourism, that wanted to see old girls standing. And under the NDP, it's the unions are going to have the hugest effect. They're looking like that kind of um, protester, um, environmentalist wing uh, is a fairly um, sm smaller part of the um, NDP voting base. And it's the unionized working class that we've got to move. So it's working with um, is, is uh, a large diversity of unions right now to get uh, to find common ground. That's how the NDP will move on this. But we are going to have to put in the work. We'll need everyone's help. If you uh, are part of a union or with a church or faith groups or with the business, um, the recreation groups, we need to undertake a large scale mobilization to get old growth protection legislation in the September sitting of the legislature. This government might fall within a year. Um, so here's our chance, this September, let's try to get that legislation introduced. Greens are on side, we've got to get the NDP there. I, I, would, I would just uh, put a, one other piece to, for us to consider here, uh, which is that, um, a, that conservation that doesn't work for the people on the landscapes where the conservation efforts are happening is probably going to fail. We've seen that around the world in a variety of capacities, whether it's like blocking out uh, uh, indigenous or you know village people from being able to hunt meat that they need to feed themselves because it's now a game reserve in Africa or um, literally just like shutting down the livelihoods for communities uh, in places where we're trying to conserve that makes sense on a bigger picture and it needs to work globally and it needs to work locally as well and I think that's where the idea of like an imagination about a positive future not just locking things down which we need to do as well but thinking about what are the opportunities here uh, how is it that we can take the idea of like this one small community forest that can you know uh, increase its uh, employment rates by five and expand that out so that we can cut way less trees and keep the same amount of employment um, because there's there are places that have been cut that will need to be managed to some degree to create some sort of positive future and so there is the opportunity to continue um, logging in some places and like how do we get the most out of that not for corporate profits uh, but for local peoples. And I think that's another part of that story that we really need to address. And that's the other way to cross that line and to bring people on the same page where it's not like we're trying to keep you from having a livelihood, uh, but we want to have a livelihood that's going to work for you and seven generations of your, of your kin down the line and also have, you know, ancient forests for us all to enjoy. So I think that's, that's the other linchpin for me in thinking about this opportunity as well. <coughs> Anybody else on that subject? Other questions? Yes, sir. I'd like to point out that human intelligence is a force of nature. And also that one of the things we do is we take action. And for
forestry is one of those actions, and there's negative consequences, but there's also positive consequences. And what's going on here, what I'm hearing is we're not talking about saving the caribou so much as saving the ecosystem. I mean, there's, there's lots of caribou, there's, there's lots of people, but there's none of these ecosystems. So I think that the strategy should be less broadly scope as we've been suggesting and get a specific strategy. And I was here in March. There was another presentation about the rest of that rainforest. And uh, Val Hallow was involved. And and I've been thinking, uh, thinking about that, and one of the things they talked about, and I didn't, didn't mention much here, but the, what they said is the reason that this caribou reserve has been depleted is because of winter predation by cougars and wolves. And what's happening is snowmobilers are going in, and they're opening up trails, and those, animal, those predators are going in, and eating, and you show in this film where the cats are born before the snow is gone. So the predators have access, that's what they're eating. They're not eating the adults when they get down, you know, with the half grown calves down in the forest. It's up there where it's just after the cats are born, they get predated. So this reserve, you say there's a dozen left. How many access routes are there into that? And here's what you do, you use pet fences. Pet, pet fences? Pet fences. You know what a pet fence is? If you're a dog, okay, pet fence, they have wireless pet fences. You've got a dog on your property and you don't want it to leave. You don't have a fence. So you've got a collar on it and when it gets out of range of the transmitter, it gets electric shock. And it comes back. So you could do the same thing at the access points, put, uh, you know, pet fences in, and then call. Then you tranquilize the predators. Got, got it. Thanks, thanks for your thoughts there. Just to summarize for folks that that didn't uh, hear that, just talking about um, that there's other facets of what's happening for caribou here, and um, and one of them includes recreation and access that human humans are creating access potentially for carnivores in the winter, which is indeed another part of the story here and, and some possible ideas for solving that. And it's, there have been a lot of creative thoughts going into how to, how to deal with this and a lot of, um, in, a lot of pushback against uh, things that impact humans. And one of the things that I'll say about caribou uh, that's really an interesting challenge and opportunity is that everything humans do in the inland rainforest to make a living uh, doesn't work in some level for caribou. So recreation, you know, when you start putting humans up in the high country in the winter, uh, it, display, it can displace caribou, it can affect predator relationships with those places. So, you know, ecotourism is actually not, is actually can be a problem for sure, as this gentleman mentions. Uh, and so it's not like you can just switch to an ecotourism economy. And, uh, and then of course, logging and mining and, you know, all these other things, even uh, hydropower is a problem for caribou and so, they really, that's the thing I think is so interesting about caribou, is that they really um, are forcing us to look at our relationship with nature on every level, right? It's looking at our re recreational relationship with it, our desire to have clean energy, our desire to have a house made of wood, uh, and forcing us to really grapple with that on every level, because at every turn the caribou are saying, no, no, no it doesn't quite work, it doesn't quite work. And so, um, I think that is an important part of the story, and I, I don't know if there's other folks that want to just speak to anything you, you mentioned there. No. Good. Otherwise, we can take. Uh, did you have? Some? Yeah, I'll just quickly say uh, we talked with a lot of different recreation user groups, and it's amazing to hear every uh, user group points the finger at another user group. Snowmobilers are uh, blaming backcountry skiers. Heli skiers are blaming snowmobilers. So it's a. It was a really hard one for us to approach in the story, and we wanted to pick um, areas where there's slightly more clarity, and one of those is we know uh, cutting old growth is really harming the caribou, so. Um, 
Yeah, that's that's very true, and, and this is where you get into kind of these band aid fixes, as we've learned, is um, you can stop um, recreationists from kind of infringing upon <coughs> sensitive caribou habitat. Um, we, there can be a predator call. There can be these maternity pens, right? These big invade. There can be these fixes that are stopping. But the reason that we're even having to do that in the first place is because of the fact that the habitat has been utterly decimated by industrial scale logging. So that's there's this foundational kind of um, uh, cause that is kind of given forth to the this very tenuous population of caribou that are now affected by these other things that are in fact. Um, it's, you know, kind of like they're they're smaller, but they're they're very impactful now because of this old, old, much deeper issue of just habitat loss and fragmentation. And I think that was a big part of our approach to this, and what we I think the narrative that we really want to push is to is to look past these band aids and really focus on like what is it that we can all agree on? Let's keep our eye on the prize, and that's intact ecosystems that provide natural services for us and for wildlife ad infinitum and so that's where we're going there's lots of arguments about how to get there but we definitely do not want to be poking each other in the eye uh, as we try to keep our eye on the target which is a, a very big project for us so uh, i'll take a couple more questions here Thar. yes um, i'm pissed off about the The world is overpopulated. I know that this is an urgent thing, but as an individual, how can I really change cons my consumerism? It's not gonna. It's not gonna be really uh, fast if I change my consumerism. But if everybody in on the planet does, I just even like you said this. When I looked at this, these trees, and you're saying that's toilet paper. It's true. We're, we're cutting our trees to wipe our ass, you know? So if we just, just, if we as a population change things, it might not have the um, immediacy of the effect, but in the long term, it will help change the ecosystem. Um, something as simple as taking little bits of, of material that I, that I use to wipe myself. And, and wash it in the laundry. Just simple things like that. Um, what I, what I want to say is how, what I want to ask is how, on the scale, the immediacy to address this, the urgency, the first step, and then down the ladder, where does the consumerism really affect this in, say, for instance, 10, 15, 20 years? Great. And just to, I'm not going to do justice to the eloquence of your words, but for folks that might not have heard very well, there's a a question about um, well, it's about consumerism and our daily choices, and and in the in the near term, how does that play into all these other kind of bigger level things that we need to do to address that? Is that a kind of an accurate summary there? So I guess uh, does anybody want to tackle tackle that question? Yes, yeah. yes, there it is. That, that's a big discussion, but I'll make it really quick here because I can go on for a while. But yeah, I, you know, there's different scales at which we have to operate in different areas. But um, mountain caribou and old growth forests don't have time for an entire, you know, shift in global population and in, um, in consumerism. Those things have to happen. I believe there's policy instruments that make that easier or harder. It's empowerment of women for population. It's, it's um, carbon taxes and uh, renewable energy alternatives and that, that can scale down the um, footprint uh, because we're, our lifestyles are also partly a product in the society in which we live. But to save mountain caribou and to save old growth forests, even you get another million or two million or three million Canadians you know, reducing their uh, paper consumption and um, washing their bums instead of uh, <laughs> instead of wiping, you know, the, the, you're still going to have the annihilation of these ecosystems, specific creatures. So there's different um, uh, things that need to be done, but we need laws. I, I'm a firm believer that people need to push governments, make law, stop the destruction at the point of resource extraction on the landscape. Those lines on a map are worth gold. It will actually keep, if you look at, just Google Earth, take a look at where the forests still remain in large blocks. It's in the provincial parks and the conservancies and the ecological reserves in this province. 
So, um, but yeah, there's everything that needs to be done. Sure. Yeah, I'll take a step. Uh, I, I lived with a guy from Iran for quite a while, and he just thought it was so gross that we used toilet paper. He's like, "You guys are really unsanitary." Um, uh, so I can relate. Um, there's caribou blood on can four two by fours. That's you know obviously there's a a more systemic and uh, markets you know uh, order that takes place for that statement to be true, but nonetheless it's a true statement. And you know I buy two by fours, uh, you know build a a shack or whatever in the in in the back or a chicken coop or a house or I maybe I'm a contractor and I'm actually buying barge loads of two by fours. Uh, so, you know, there de definitely is a shorter term market impact that you can reverberate back through that. Um, <clears throat> and then, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a cynic when it, when it comes to, to politics and sort of uh, mainstream charitable advocacy activity, which I'm not really supposed to say because I, I work in a mainstream charitable <laughs> organization. Um, but I, can, like, I, I, I lost hope in the processes that are available to us in a social democracy known as Canada um, a long time ago. I, like Ken turned me on to this stuff when I was 15. Literally, I was showing up to Ken Wu rallies when I was pretty young. Thanks, Ken. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then I was like, well, you know, these petitions, like whatever petitions and like whatever calling your MLA and whatever to all this, like we need direct action, we need affirmative action, we need to do shit, we need to blockade, we need to whatever, and went down that path as well. Uh, and, you know, I've been arrested countless times and thrown in the back of police cruisers and, and uh, kind of worked within those tactics as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's awesome, it's great. And also, Sometimes those tactics don't get you any further down the road either. And then sometimes I've had this strange re reawakening to petitions where I'm, a, I'm like, I'm kind of a believer again. I'm like, oh, sometimes the MLA does pick up the phone, you know? But people actually do that a lot less than you think they're doing it. People are actually not filing as many petitions as you think are being filed. Like you were getting bombarded with it a lot. Um, but actually, it, like, so now I'm in a position where I do this kind of work and I'm hearing from the other end, from uh, constituency offices, from assistant deputy ministers, from mid-level bureaucrats in Flynn Row Ministry, like people that work for Chris Ritchie, they, like, they, they care and they get freaked out if they get a letter. They're like, oh shit, someone actually does, someone spent the time to do that. And like, you know, they've got kids, they don't want to tell their kids that they're contributing to the end of Caribou. Uh, and so I'd actually say like, make those calls, call your MLA. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the internal radical in me is like, no, nah, it doesn't work, but I think it actually does. I think there's, I think we need to employ all of those tactics at once uh, in a way. We need to be going all systems on all of those different tactics. So do whatever you're empowered to do. If it's, if it's through the consumer marketplace, like don't buy those two by fours. Don't buy that toilet paper, sure. You know, or if it is through direct action, sure. But, uh, you know, whatever it is that you feel most empowered to do, do it. Thanks. Uh, I see one more thing really quickly about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, okay, that. That's a common uh, discussion within the environmental movement. I started off in the direct action movement in my teens there in the Earth First when, in my 17, 18, 19. And then I started um, you know, evolving and, and seeing bigger. What I started to realize is it's not the tactic that matters, like the tool in the toolbox. Like who, who if you're going to make a house, says the only thing I use is a hammer. It's like but you need to saw off that part. Like, I only use a hammer. It's like, but you actually have to paint that. I'll hammer it. Like, you know, it's the only legitimate thing is a hammer. So the, the, the point being is that it's, it's, um, it's the bigger approach that matters. And you use the tool that, that is useful at the time or the multiplicity of tools. And the key thing, I believe, it's a large scale, broad based movement of informed people who are pushing. So in other words, a lot of people and a lot of people different than you who have different motivations. Chamber of Commerce may want to save old growth because they want tourism there. Forestry workers are supporting us now. The two of the three unions are saying, don't log the old growth, but it didn't happen just like that. It's because we spent a lot of time with them over like 15 years to work together to get there. Now they're saying, log second growth, mill it, process it here, and protect the old growth. So it's seeing things from other people's perspectives and making sure economies in there, businesses, solutions, jobs, um, it's not all about lichens, even though I love lichens and caribou. <laughs> there's, you know, there's different interests, different motivations. Great, thank you. And I want to um, 
Do you have something you want to say there? Okay, um, I wanted to bring it close to this uh, panel here, just looking at the time, and uh, um, and just a couple of closing thoughts here, and I'll open it up if, if there's any kind of closing thoughts on this. But I did want to end on a point of hope, and something that Greg Utick said in the film, which is um, even though things look bleak, he still has hope because he loves these places. And I think coming back to your question, something that comes up for me that impels me forward is um, as actually a lesson that um, I learned uh, first from one of my mentors who's a rare plant botanist and he just had the humility to say like I can't save it all and I don't know what's going to be important on the other end of the of this cataclysm which is coming to earth which I cannot stop but I can do my part and I can try to save these plants that I have a relationship with and on the other side of this there's going to be a rebuilding process and whatever I can do to usher a bit more to the other side of that is what I can do and, and that's, that's how I have hope and I stay motivated is I don't try to fix everything, I can just do my part and like do it to the best of my ability. And then the last thing that I learned from this project is from camera trapping. And it was so demoralizing so often. And um, I'd be like, why am I even bothering with this? But there's this realization that if we didn't go out there and set those cameras, I could guarantee we would get nothing. And if, and if the chances of getting something were just up by a little bit, then it's worth going. And that's really, you know, for me, where we're at is like, there's really not a choice, right? You've got to do whatever it is that you have the power to do. And that can be the large things and the small things, but that's where my hope and my optimism comes from is because um, being pessimistic about this is just maladaptive. It's just not worth it. Like, uh, we've got to look forward and think of a positive future, and that's the only possibility we have to get there. Um, so that's the thing, that's what I'll just wrap up by saying, and I just want to open up to the rest of the crew here if there's any kind of closing thoughts you have. Just real quickly to um, echo what Dave said about his mentor having, he wanted to save the things that he already had a relationship with, like he can't save everything, but he wants to, he can try for the things he has a relationship with, and this can be really depressing and demoralizing work to try to save something and to keep ourselves going we have to tend those relationships so whatever it is that you have to do to get out there and like actually be with these trees or with this forest or with these animals is really important because it's going to fuel you great anything else from anybody else we'll be around to answer questions and such as well. Otherwise, um, thanks for listening to the panel, and then I'm going to pass it on to Marcus, who will take us on to whatever's next, including a raffle where we give away a lot of cool gear. So thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, and so just that. Yeah, I'm just going to close with one more piece on that theme. I really appreciate the toolbox metaphor. And, you know, we've got all these different organizations that are just supporting this small event in our project. Uh, you know, Sierra Club and Ancient Forest Alliance and who are out there just getting into the policy and the degree and figuring this stuff out just how much I've learned from hanging out with these two gentlemen for the last two days is incredible um, and then we've got organizations like the Wilderness Awareness School and, and Bailey what's your what's the organization what's the name Wisdom of the Earth Wisdom of the Earth just here on Vancouver that's Island Salt that's Salt doing Island. that's Salt Spring Island yeah doing the work of just like tying heartstrings to the living world Right? All of that's important, and we just the, the toolbox, it's all got to be there. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And like Wade said, Wade Davis said, it's a, it's a dearth of imagination. And we have a, a power as a species, and that power cuts both ways. Right? And like we can do some really amazing things with our creativity, with our ingenuity, with our hearts involved, and with our, our, our uh, intelligence involved. And um, so, like, how can we have more of these conversations and be allies together and just each take our next best steps? That's all we can do. Just what's our next best steps for that, right? And, and the last thing I'm going to end on is just, and I've told this story the last couple nights, and I'll just keep this brief, but um, it's something that was big for me in getting the hearts involved is this people connection. And the, the man in this film that was felling the trees, his name's Dave. And one of the most powerful experiences I've had over the last two years was going up and spending a day and a half on that old growth uh, clear cut with those loggers. 
and it was the first time I ever had that experience. And I just want to speak that 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 man, Dave, is 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 such a sweet, sweet, gentle, incredible human being. And we're not demonizing him or them at all. And yes, there are these systems that I think should be like yes, that is there is there is this archetype of enemy there that we should be working towards. But those humans are just doing what they have to do. And like, how can we connect with them? And he had this beautiful. He was such a sweet, soulful, or a sweet, uh, connected man to those woods. And he and he got really excited about this toad that was there. And he showed Dave and I this toad. And he shepherded it up the hill. And he was all excited about this toad. And then he went about his work of cutting the trees down again. And it was just like, wow, we've got some complex problems here. <laughs> and and like for me, I was feeling that. And like it's like, oh, it's too simple. It's too easy to just demonize. Like it's it, the, the beautiful sobering complexity of just us being this human species doing this thing, crazy thing called culture and trying to figure it out and keep this world going. Like, because for whatever reason, we've been given power that these other species don't have. And so what are we going to do with it? Uh, so I just want to speak that and, um, and yeah, and, and just wrap with that. Thank you all so much for coming out. And um, a big thanks to um, CPAWS and to the Land Conservancy of British Columbia for promoting and supporting. And big thanks to the Sierra Club um, and to Mark for doing so much over the last couple of events and helping us out. It's been awesome and promoting this event. Um, these, yeah, incredible folks here and to the Ancient Forest Alliance again. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we really, really appreciate it. And to Wilderness Awareness School and Springtail Soil Regeneration for making these events possible. It's, it's awesome. So thank you. Grapple. Yes. Yeah. Ready for some prizes. Can somebody grab those drugs for me? Some of my people. And what we're going to